Well, how's everybody doing this morning? It is great to see everyone today. Obviously, I'm not Pastor Terry. If this is your first time, I say it every time I speak. We have an amazing pastor. Would you guys all agree? Yeah, he is. Yeah, go ahead. Let's give it up for them. Pastor Terry and Becky, they've literally been here as long as I've been alive. I always want to do my best to honor them every time that he allows me to speak. He's not on vacation. This week he's actually in Rala speaking at another church, um, which Pastor doesn't really typically do that a lot, but uh, this was a church that they're really growing in Rala. They've been connected with us for uh, a while now, and so they asked him to come down and speak, and Pastor just really felt like he wanted to do that. And so uh, he's actually going to be speaking, I don't know exactly, I think in an hour or so. Um, and, and I just, I texted him this, this morning and just said, man, I just believe you got a great word for Rala. And, and uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to loan our pastor out a little bit, so you've got the B team, so hopefully that's okay. Um, but we're, let's, let's pray for him and Becky and just pray that God uses him with where he's at, and then we'll jump in today. Is that cool? Father, we thank you, Lord, for Pastor Terry. God, we thank you for that church in Rala. Lord, we thank you that you have a word for that church today. God, I pray that you would just allow Pastor to flow in your spirit. God, help him to, to be led by you. Lord, from the, from the moment that he gets there, God, God, we thank you that people's hearts are softened to hear your voice. God, I just pray that you prepare the people as they're driving in, as they're coming into to church this morning. God, that you would prepare their hearts to hear the word that you have for them through Pastor. And God, I just pray that you give an extra blessing to Pastor Terry and Becky and help them just to get rest, help them to be, re, be uh, re-energized in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Tony Tiller. I'm the campus pastor here. Um, I've been at the church, I don't even know how long, it's been over a decade, but I've been here for a while and I'm excited to be able to speak with you today. Today what we're going to talk about is actually kind of a, a continuation of my last few messages. And so uh, it's, it was kind of funny, you know, anytime I try to figure out, you know, okay, whenever pastor asks me to speak, like, what do you want to hear? What do you want to speak, Lord? I always want to make sure I'm speaking whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to the body of Christ. And so I, I was kind of doing that today, and I, I realized that the past three times it, uh, I, I, that I've spoken in the, in the year and a half or so, I realized I kind of opened it the same way with the same line of, if you see the world today, everything's kind of crazy, right? And I realized that the last three messages that uh, God had me speak since I've been here is kind of a series. You know, pastor will often speak in series. You know, his is usually four or five weeks long. Mine just is taking about a year and a half to kind of complete. And so, and that's okay. And so I realized though that this is kind of the end part of the series that God has had me put together. And so because it's been a year and a half and usually, you know, whenever, I mean, you guys are probably going to leave today and completely forget most of what I say. So I'm going to do a quick refresher of kind of the last three messages, because the last three messages really kind of set up what I want to talk to today. Because, as you can tell, the world is going crazy, right? And I believe that us as Christians need to begin to get equipped in a bigger way than really we've been used to. We were in a staff meeting a couple weeks ago, and we were just kind of talking about the world and, you know, the past, you know, generation or whatever, and and Rory, who is pastor's assistant, um, she kind of just made a comment and said, you know, our generation, and, and I think this speaks to, you know, us as humans and, and just us as, as Christians, like, we haven't really been, especially in America, we haven't really been pressured too much. You know what I mean? Like, it's been pretty easy to, to be a Christian, right? And I think that that season is kind of coming to an end. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to start, you know, having crazy persecution and we're going to have to give our lives for Jesus. It might come to that at some point. But I will say that I think that there's going to become a separation pretty soon where you can't be lukewarm anymore. Right? We have to either be all in or all out. If you look in the book of Revelation, what does he say about being lukewarm? He says, I spit you out of my mouth. How many of you guys know, like, lukewarm soda's bad, right? Like, I, it most, unless I'm, like, dying of thirst, I probably don't want lukewarm soda. Lukewarm coffee, not the best. I either want it hot or I want it cold. You got to pick one, right? There, in the season that we're entering right now, you don't have the option to be a lukewarm Christian anymore. Well, you have the option, but you're probably not going to make it very far. We have the ability to do that, but it's not going to benefit you. And quite honestly, your spiritual survival is dependent on you choosing today to not be lukewarm anymore. We have to decide that we're going to do this. And what is this? Get knowing our Savior, know, like having a relationship with God, 
And secondly, being on mission. What does that mean? You are still here for a reason. You, are st- you have a purpose that's greater than Sunday morning. Like these seats are great and they need people to sit in them, but that's not your purpose. It might be into whatever. Our purpose is we need to, because of how well we know our Savior, we need to be so engaged and so in love with him that it drives and motivates us to what? Go tell other people about this amazing person that we know. We can't just be lukewarm and set that on the shelf anymore and be like, well, I got my Sunday morning, I got my worship in, and I'm just going to kind of, you know, engage in life and, and, and kind of coast by anymore. We can't do that. So what I want to kind of set up, I want to do a quick review. Again, the last, the last three things that I talked about was this. The first message was talking about seasons. When we talk about seasons, the whole point of that, over, that, that message was this. You, there, there is a natural seasons in our lives that happen, okay? And you can't, you are the same person, but you can't enter the, the, uh, uh, certain seasons like you entered the last season. What do I mean by that? You can't go into winter dressed like it's summer, right? Because if you do that, what's going to happen? You're going to freeze to death. If it's zero degrees outside, and I go in and I say, man, I'm going to just, I don't care. I'm just going to choose to not, uh, you know, I love summer more. I'm going to go boating. I'm going to, you know, wear my shorts and flip-flops. How many of you guys know if I spend a couple hours outside, I'm going to have issues. And it's going to hurt me. It's going to mess me up, right? We have to be able to recognize the season that we're in. That's what Jesus told us is he actually rebuked his disciples at one point. I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but here we go. Matthew chapter 16 verse 14 says this the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven he replied when evening comes you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in, in, in the morning today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky but you cannot interpret the signs of the times what is Jesus saying if you are a Christian You should be able to say, man, what's going on in the world today isn't just about, you know, this isn't just coincidence. What's going on in the world today is because there's spiritual things happening in the background. And I have to understand that although I might not know exactly when the storm's going to start, how many of you guys know we can look out this way and be like, oh, man, this is going to be a doozy. I probably should get in the basement or, oh man, you know, I probably should pull my car in the garage or, you know, whatever. We, We should be able to look down and say, Man, spiritually, what's coming down the pipe, that's something's different. I mean, think about this, guys. People in the world who don't know Jesus, have you had these conversations? Man, does it just feel, does the world just feel weird to you? They ask you these questions like, what's going on? Something just seems to be different. Why? Because even though they might not know Jesus, how many know they're still spirit, we're still spiritual beings? Which means we can spend, sense the spiritual things that are happening around us, right? Something is changing. We have entered a new season spiritually. And we have to understand that we have to act differently. We have to realize that it's not business as usual. I cannot interact spiritually this season like I did a decade ago. I can, what what worked a decade ago is not going to work now. It's different. So we have to be able to say, God, what are you speaking to us? If you dress in the winter like it's summer, it's going to hurt you. So what season are we in? Again, this is, just, this is just my first message, all right? What season are we in? That goes into the second message that I talked about, which was about end times. I gave you guys an overview of, of why I, I, try, I try to do a third 25-minute, like, real quick, here's why I think that this, the season that we're entering into is the end times. Now, we can't be certain, but we can take a look at what Jesus said about the end times and say, well, we're pretty close. Like, something, I mean... The, at least the, the, the basic truth is, even if we're not in the end times right now, how many of you guys know we're the, we're the closest as any generation has ever been, right? So why not act like it? Jesus was telling us way back then, he was telling his disciples way back then, hey, you need to, to, to change the way that you act because we're in the end times. That was, a, that was thousands of years ago, right? So we are the generation that's the, been the closest, but let's look at it. Matthew 24, and I'm not going to go through the, the whole thing. I would encourage you guys to read it uh, on your own. But here's the, here's the highlight reel, if you will, of what Jesus said the season of the end times would include. Wars and rumors of wars. Check, check, check. <laughs> Famines. Earthquakes. 
pestilences. Pestilences are, 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 are plagues or diseases. Things like COVID. If you look at all these other, you know, all these other things like, oh, this, this might be coming up. That's part of what he talked about. False prophets. Lawlessness. This is a good one. The gospel being preached to all nations. That's a happy one, right? The rebirth of Israel. That's what one chapter talks about when he says, this is what the, the, the season of the end times is going to look like. And if you are entering that season, if this is truly what we are, one thing I talked about in that second message is, is we have to understand if this is truly the season that we're in, that means we're in the two-minute warning. What does that mean? We, you play the game of football differently when you're in the two-minute warning. You can't make decisions that you would in the first quarter because you don't have that much time. Every play is much more important because you might not get a chance to replay that play, right? If you mess up in the first quarter, it's like, oh, you know, there's some grace. We can kind of try to make it up or, you know, whatever. But you can't necessarily do that. You can, the win or the lose is, could be determined by the choices you make in that two-minute warning. The margin of error is smaller. That's the season I believe that we in the church are in right now. We don't, have the, we don't have the ability to just kind of play with sin anymore. We don't have the ability to just be like, oh, this and this, you know, I'm just going to kind of toy with this a little bit and see what happens. No, we, we have to be on point. We have to be diving into our relationship with Jesus, which leads me to my, my third message that I did just a couple months ago. And it's this, that we have to be able to hear the voice of God. What is that? You know, your number one purpose do you know what your number one purpose is? To know God, for him to know you. Because out of that, everything else will flow. A lot of times when we talk about purpose, we talk about what we're supposed to do for Jesus, who we're supposed to reach. And I think that that's a huge part of it. But you can't do that if you don't know Jesus. What did Jesus say? Whenever people get to heaven, he's gonna, they're going to say, God, Jesus, we, we casted out demons in your name. We, we did all of this and these things. And Jesus said, depart from me, I what? You guys know the word. Depart from me. I never knew you. Our, our, Jesus is more worried about you knowing him than he is about your works, right? And a lot of times we really understand that when it comes to like our salvation, but then after we get saved, we try to kind of go back into works a little bit. We have to understand that our number one purpose is knowing God. What's your daily devotion look like? I'm speaking to myself here like, man, I got to I got to adjust that. I got to get more in, you know, what are some things that I could set, could set aside that maybe aren't going to give me any eternal value so I can get to know Jesus more? Because here's the thing, and if we are truly in the last days, you know, one thing I talked about in the end times is that as, as the activity increases spiritually, uh, the it, it, it continues, to, it's like it's the water level increases both ways, right? So if there's darkness that's increasing, you know, that's, that can be scary. But you know what's awesome? Is that also means the activity of the Holy Spirit is going to rise. We're going to, I believe that if this is truly the end times and we, we have people who are equipped to hear the voice of God and they're going to, we're going to begin to see miracles like we've never seen before. Because darkness activity is increasing, that's okay. So is the Holy Spirit's activity increasing. And that's going to be an amazing thing to be a part of. But to have that, you got to be able to hear the voice of God. So what all of that kind of brings me to is this. We have to get prepared for what's next. And the biggest thing that as I look out and I look at, man, what are the things that, the, that Christians are struggling with the most is you can know God, but your love begins to grow cold. Why? Because the enemy might not be able to, to take away your salvation because you are, you know, you're doing your daily, but, but he can divide you against people. Look at what's happening in the world right now. There's a division that's happening over things that aren't going to matter in 2,000 years whenever we're all at each other's houses talking about this. You know what I'm saying? Look, you know, vaccine versus no vaccine or whatever, those things can pin us against each other where instead of us wanting to reach people, our love grows cold and we say, Pfft, I'm not even going to talk to you or I'm going to push you away. There's so many. How many of you guys would say we are, the world is probably the most divisive, divisive it has ever been? And I, I'm beginning to see that even creep into my life and the church's life where the very people that we're called to reach, we are saying, you stay over there. I don't like what you think about X, Y, and Z. Why don't you just stay over there? 
and I'm not going to interact with you. Do you guys realize if we don't interact with people, they will go to hell? Think about that. If we don't de de decide to put down our opinions and things that honestly really don't matter, that's going to be an eternal difference for the people that we are called to reach. Here's what Jesus said about the end times. He said in Matthew 24, verse 12, he said, Because of the increase in, of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. Now, I think a lot of times we can read something like that, and we can say, oh, well, if, you know, that, that's just talking about the world. No, I think he's talking about us too. He didn't specify there that the love of the world will grow cold. I think that's true. But he said what? The love of many will grow cold. That is a, pos a possibility for all of us. Do you know what we all are? We are vessels, right? We are like conduit. We are like pipes. We don't get to create the amazing thing that gives people life, but we get to be vessels for it, right? It, 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 we're coming up on winter right now. We've got a pool at our house. And if you've got a pool or a boat, what is the, what is the one thing you have to do around this time every year? You've got to winterize it, right? Because you've got pipes that are filled with water, right? And that water is supposed to flow. But whenever you get a cold season that comes in, if that water remains in there and it's not moving and, it's, it's there, and there's a cold season around it, what happens to that water? It begins to bust the pipes, right? And it creates a lot of damage that's going to cost a lot of money. If you've got a pool, you're going to have to dig up your whole yard because your pipes are busted. If you've got a boat, it's going to literally break your engine. Here's what I want to suggest to you. Jesus said that the love of many is going to grow cold because of the, wit the, the wickedness that's happening. We are the pipes. And if we allow what was once flowing through us to grow cold, not only will the water not move to the source it needs to get to, it will also bust the vessel, which is us at the same time. And so we have to begin to say, I am going to stay warm. I'm going to be like the, those heated pipes or, you know, whatever. I'm not going to allow the love. You know, the atmosphere around me is changing and it's growing cold. But I'm not going to let this wick wickedness make it to where me as a vessel is going to make this water freeze. We have to look at this and say, you know what? I'm going to choose to put aside this opinion of whatever it is. Because in 2,000 years, how many of you guys know it doesn't matter if you were vaccinated or not vaccinated? It doesn't matter if you were a Republican or Democrat. None of that is going to matter. So why would we allow that to separate us from the very people that we have to reach? Doesn't matter. Let it go. Whether you, you know, it, we're all going to die by then. So what it, let's let it go. We have to make sure, and, and I, would say that, I would say it this way, the biggest trap that's set before on fire Christians right now is our love growing cold. And it's easy to say, oh, that's not going to happen to me. Look, I know it feels like everything is going crazy right now, but wickedness is just going to get a lot worse. We got to begin to train ourselves now. You know, if you would have asked us, you know, three years ago, whenever COVID and all that was kind of starting, and, um, you know, we were like, man, the world's crazy. And it, it feels like every month, the world gets crazier, right? If that pace continues, we've got to get ourselves ready because the division is just going to increase. Here's what the Bible says. James 1.20 says this, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If you get anything from today, I would suggest that at some point between now and next week, I want you to go home get a journal out, get some paper out, and just say, what makes me angry? And write it down. What makes me angry? It might be a specific person. It might be, you, when this topic comes up, this makes me angry. Whenever this person's name is mentioned, it makes me angry. When this person's political party is mentioned, it makes me angry. Write those things down. And then ask the Holy Spirit to teach you, how do I not become angry anymore? Because although there is a, a, a place for anger, Jesus had, was angry, God was angry, most of the time, our anger does not produce the righteousness of God. And let, let me connect those. Whenever you talk about the righteousness of God, what does that mean? Righteousness means right standing with God. So you really can say the anger of man does not produce other people becoming in right standing with God. So we have to learn how to push that down. And instead of being angry at people, we got to love them. 
How do we do that? Well, that's my goal to give you some tips today. Glad you asked. <laughs> First thing is this, is you have to understand what Ephesians 6.12 says. It says this, our fight is not with people. I'm going to say that again. Our fight is not with people. Our fight is not with Joe Biden. Our fight is not with Donald Trump. Our fight is not against the Palestinians. Our fight is not fill in the blank of whoever you're angry with. Who is it with? Our f- it is against the leaders and the powers of the, and the spirits of the, dark in this, of the darkness in this world. That is who our fight is against. Whenever we have people that are engaging in that, what's happening is they are prisoners of war. They are deceived. There is some level of deception that's happening in, the, in, in what just happened in Israel. I'm not saying what happened was right, but how many of you guys know God still loves the Palestinians? Somebody? God still loves them. Look, your, two-thirds of your New Testament was written by a guy who also killed Christians. And because of one moment, he was changed, and then he became somebody to, to create what we have around us right? We have to begin, let me ask you this. I want you, uh, this, just because this will be easy. Don't say it out loud. I want you to think of whatever political person that you just really frustrates you, okay? Yeah, you all are laughing because you know. You spend lots of time thinking about them. Can I ask you a question? Has your time that you've complained about them equaled your time that you pray for them? Because if not, then I would say we're probably, and I'm, I'm talking to me too here, so I'm not, I'm not saying I'm doing this perfect because I'm not. But if not, I would say that our love is starting to grow cold. Maybe it's not 32 degrees outside. Maybe, maybe we're just at 40, so the water's still flowing, but it's getting darn close. Because here's the thing. Us as Christians should be able to recognize, man, your deal is not because you, you, uh, my fight's against you, it's because there are spiritual forces that are influencing you in wrong ways, and hey, I as a Christian have authority over those, and I'm going to do my best to take authority so you can stop being deceived and you can be saved. That should be our mentality. Whether it's with the political party, pe- people that we are frustrated with, whether it's with that, you know, person that you you know, fill in the blanks, whatever. It can be more personal as well. All of us have those people where it's like, man, I'd be happy if I never see them again. <laughs> like, you know? Have you, what, what, is, what, how, what does that look like for us to try to, can, to, to try to reach those people? Our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's against those people are the prisoners of war. And we have to begin to see them like that. Now sometimes, well, I'll get to that in a second. So, why is, this, why is this so important? Because again, I think that wickedness is going to continue to increase, which means what we're even seeing right now, it's going to continue. And we have to realize that this isn't going to get easy for us. We have to realize that we've got to start doing this every day, and we've got to get really good at this love walk. How do I know that? Well, because of these few verses that I'm going to fire off at you. I'm going to test Linda. We'll see how quick she can, well, I'm going to read fast here. Here's what the Bible says, if we're truly in the season of the last days, here's what the Bible says that how people are going to act. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, I already shared this one with you, but we'll do it again. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. We're going to start to see those, you know, those people that we always said, man, they're a good person, they just don't know Jesus yet, you know, they, 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 but they act like you know, Christians should. We're going to start seeing those guys not act like they should. We're going to have, that there's going to be, the love of many is going to grow cold. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 says this, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on since the beginning of creation. They're going to begin to mock us. They're going to begin to say, you guys are idiots. They've been saying this for years. That's going to be tough to take in. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in the last time, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. There's going to be people in our church that we look up to, and then all of a the sudden they just disappear because they've been deceived. That's going to be tough. Jude chapter 1. Well, there's only one chapter in Jude, so shit. Jude, <laughs> verse 18. 
They said to you in the uh, they said to you in the last time there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. There's going to be others. Why are these verses super important? Because we have to understand that it's not business as usual. We've been playing this game on easy mode. <laughs> Do you know what that means? Whenever you're playing video games, there's an easy mode, a medium mode, and a hard mode. And, you know, the, the guys that are shooting at you or whatever game you're playing in easy mode, you know, they, like, act like they don't see you for, like, 20 seconds, and it's really easy to take them out, right? But when you get to hard mode, it, you get seen real fast, and the game changes. God just flipped the game up. We're, going, we're walking into hard mode. All right. So here's the trap that's going to be set before us. Our love is growing cold. So what does it look like to have true flowing love? What does this look like? First thing is this. We, we kind of already touched on this already. Realize that your fight is not against the person, but it's against the spirits that are influencing them. And realize that you have authority. The closer the person is to you, the more authority you have. Now, let me say this too. Just because you begin praying for somebody, how many of you guys know they have a choice? They can choose. They, there, is, there is people that are going to clearly see the truth, but because they don't want to give up their sin, they're going to choose not to accept it. But our purpose is to pray for those people. we got to pray for those people because that's what causes their deception to be lifted. But them making the choice is what's going to determine whether they move in or not. So all of that to say, don't be discouraged if you begin praying for people and you don't see no change. I'll say this also. Sometimes the change, the, the, the things that your prayers are initiating is them staying up late at night, not being able to sleep because somebody's praying for them and they're starting to see the craziness happen, but they don't want to change just yet. Man, our prayers, just because you're not seeing the fruit doesn't mean that the roots aren't growing underneath. So continue to pray for those people. People's action, this is the second thing, is not, should not be what dictates our reaction. Here's what Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 36 says. This is kind of a long passage, but I want us to get this. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. That's tough. Think about that. Enemies implies they are trying to take you out for whatever reason. They're talking behind your back. They're, and, and, and if you look in the Bible, in some cases, they're literally trying to kill you. Right? And we might face that at some point. What does the Bible say? It doesn't, it, says, don't, it doesn't say get revenge. It says pray for them, for those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who believe the same way that you do. No, that's not, that's not what it says. It says pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. Listen to this part. If you only love those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. What's happening? He's making a distinction and saying, look, sinners know how to love people who love them. That's not your calling. Our calling is to love people who don't love us. Because that's going to be the only thing that gets them to change. Gets them to turn. Let's continue. And if you do good to only those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. Sorry. And if you lend money to only those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will do that. Verse 35. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be replayed. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will be truly acting as children of the Most High. Look at that. It's at that point is when we are actually acting like children of God. What's he saying there? If you love others who despitefully use you, that's when you are beginning to act like a child of God. That's what God wants. Our level of our ability to love other people really is a, is a reflection of how much you love God. Because what? We're vessels, right? Look, if you've got a small amount of water flowing, it's because you don't have enough coming from the source. So there's not much to give outside of the vessel, right? So if you're struggling in your love walk, you don't have to, I don't, I, I'm not suggesting that you go through this and say, oh, I got to love people better. And you're just like under your breath, like, <laughs> you know, like, and you've got this, this, this tension happening. No, just fall in love more with God. And then God will show you what's happening behind the scenes. And then you'll begin to look at people in the same way that Jesus, whenever he said, God, they're just like a sheep without a shepherd. 
That's why they're acting like this. And you'll be able to see through his eyes. Look, you can't change your vision. You can't. We can't do it. We have to just get closer to God. If you're struggling to love people, push into Jesus. And then he'll begin to show you why he loves them. Okay? I'm going to end with a couple things here. We're almost done. Isn't that great? Under a half hour. Come on now. If you knew, uh, think about somebody that, that, that frustrates you. If you knew that your unconditional love, your forgiveness towards them, could literally impact generations, it could be the difference between generations of people getting saved or not, would you choose to lay down your interest and your desire of being right or whatever that looks like, would you choose to lay that down? I know I would. I want to share a story with you. I was reading this a couple weeks ago, and um, something just jumped out at me. Acts chapter 7 starts in verse 54, and we're going to go through a little bit, uh, verse 8. I'm sorry, chapter 8. We're talking about Stephen here. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen, and they shook their fists in rage at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing at the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told him, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they placed their hands over their ears. And be, I didn't see that before. They placed their hands over their ears, meaning I don't want to hear what you have to say about Jesus and what you're seeing. And they began shouting. They rushed at him, and they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at their feet of a young man named Saul. You guys know your word. Who did Saul become? Paul. What did Paul do? He wrote two-thirds in the New Testament and started churches all over, and it's probably the reason you and I are standing here. Let's continue. As they stoned Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees and shouted, Lord, don't charge them with this sin, and with that he died. Saul was one of the witnesses, and he ag agreed completely to the killing of Stephen. Now, I don't have time to read what happens next, but what happens next is, is Saul's conversion to Paul. What is that? If, 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 I would encourage you to read it, but directly following this, Paul gets a vision from Jesus. Jesus is saying, why are you persecuting me? Again, he is the one who is going around killing Christians, thinking he's doing that in the name of God. And, and he goes through and he has this amazing vision and all of these events transpired where he becomes one of the greatest apostles of our time. He, he gave us two-thirds of the New Testament. He is a pillar to our faith. Now, I can't prove this necessarily biblically, but you guys know, okay, I can prove this part. Your ability to release forgiveness to people, do you guys know that that unlocks something spiritually? It, the, there's an authority that comes with that, that unlocks things, I think, for generations. I was reading this a couple weeks ago, and if you notice, Stephen is in, in the middle of his pain, in the middle of his innocence, in the middle of him being completely wronged by people, what is he doing? He's forgiving those who are doing it. Not after the fact. This isn't like Stephen got to heaven and was like, oh, wow, this mansion is so amazing. Okay, forgive those people down there. Like, they're the reason I'm here. That's not what happened. In the middle, while his pain was happening, while the rocks were hitting his body, he screams out and says what? God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And here's what I feel like the Holy Spirit spoke to me at that time. Whenever I was reading this a couple weeks ago, he said, do you think we would have the New Testament if Stephen didn't do that? I think that when Stephen forgave those people, who was included? It says Saul was there. I think that there was a blanket forgiveness that happened, and that is what allowed Saul, who became Paul, to have a visitation from Jesus because of what Stephen did. Because of Stephen's forgiveness, because of Stephen's actions, it unlocked something for Paul's life, which then unlocked something for generations that is still happening today. Because of one man's forgiveness towards other people. Of, and again, he was acting in the, in the highest level. Like, this wasn't just like, oh, they posted a bad post about me on Twitter. Like, or, you know, they talked bad about me on Facebook and tagged me in it. Like, that's, that's what we often see as persecution, you know. No, he was being killed. And I don't know about you, but I feel like if I'm going to be killed, like stoning is probably one of the worst ways to go. Like, I feel like that takes a little bit of time, right? Like, I, that's, not, that's not what I would choose. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I was joking. This is a little light comedy. I was joking at staff meeting. Like, I feel like when we get to heaven, 
you know, we're all like talking and having our campfires. We're going to, well, you know, talking to each other, hanging out. I feel like we're going to like, so what's your death story? You know, like, like how, did, how did you die? You know, like, I want a good one. I don't want to just be like, oh, you know, I died in a car crash or something. Like, I, I want like, you know, a bird came down and plucked my eye out or something. I, I don't know. And maybe that's a little morbid. but <laughs> I want a good death story. I want something unique. Anyway, I don't know why I, that wasn't in my notes. That's just, uh, that's a free one for you. So how do we walk in forgiveness? I got to go quick because I'm, I'm a bit behind. How do we walk in love? You got to fight with forgiveness and you got to fight battles that are going to matter 2,000 years ago. Here's what I want to say about forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean you have to trust people because God is asking us to forgive enemies, which means they might still hurt us. God doesn't want you just to be placed in the line of fire intentionally. So what does it look like to truly forgive people? Do you know what forgiveness is? It's just a release of punishment. It just means, God, I don't want you to punish this person for what they did to me. And because of that, that allows me to, to be like, yeah, you stay over there because you might still hurt me because you haven't given your life to Jesus yet. So I'm going to let you let that go. I, don't, I, don't, I, I want to forget, release that punishment from you. And I'm not going to get close to you, enemy, you know, until you, until, you, until you give your life to Jesus. Now, I, I, what, I remember there was this one time. I don't even remember who it was or what it was about. But um, I remember uh, several years back I was you know, going through this whole, like, God, you know, there's somebody wronged me, and I, I was like, yeah, God, forgive them, you know, you want to do the Christian thing, like, please forgive them, whatever, and I remember saying, kind of, or thinking in my prayer, like, but God, I'm going to forgive them, but I can't wait till you, they meet you face to face after their life's over, and I know you're going to bring it up, and God said, you know, true forgiveness is you asking me not to bring it up at that meeting, and I was like, oh, I don't like that one, <laughs> like, that's, that's, that was my hope in this whole forgiveness thing, right? That's what true forgiveness is. It's you saying, I don't want you to ever speak about this again to them, God. Completely release them of punishment. Don't even talk about it to them. Act like it never happened. That's what he does for us. Why can't we, 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 we need to release that to other people. That's what forgiveness looks like. All right, I'm skipping ahead because I'm running out of time here. We have to fight for all people. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says this. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people, not just people who you agree with, not just for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. <laughs> pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives. This is our mission. And look, we got to realize we're like the Navy SEALs going into a mission that's not easy, but it's accomplishable. Is that a word? Accomplishable? You, we can't accomplish it. We can do it. This is what we're called to. This is why we're still here. It's the number one thing. Other than you knowing Jesus, this is the number one thing. I want to leave you with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You all know it. It's a love chapter. I really just felt like God wanted me to speak this over you. Here's what it says. <clears throat> if I can speak all the languages of the earth and of the angels, but I didn't love, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that could move mountains but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would gain nothing. If I was to add anything here, I would say, if I went to church every morning, if I read my Bible every morning, if I prayed every day but I didn't love others, it doesn't matter. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture, but when the time of perfection come, these parcel things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we, will, we, will re, we see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. God, we just thank you, Lord, for today. God, we thank you that you've called us to love. God, not only have you called us to love, you've given us the ability to do it. God, I just pray for every person in here. If we're having struggles with maybe one person or a group of people or 
whatever areas that we're struggling with this, God, I thank you that by your spirit, that you give us the ability, that you would help us to be trained in this so that we can fully complete the mission you've set out before us. God, I pray for any person in here that's struggling to, to love people, that you would show them in an unusual way this week how much God loves them so they can extend that to other people. God, we thank you for that. The only way that you can do what I was talking about today is if you give your life to Jesus. You can't give love if you've never received love. Jesus said that we were enemies of him, but he decided to give his life and become our sin so that he can bring us back in. If you've never given your life to Jesus, we're going to just do a simple prayer together. And it's not this prayer that's, that, that saves you, but it's this prayer that is a marking point of you saying, this is the moment that I decided to give my entire life to Jesus. It's a point where you can look back and say, this is the time I said yes to him and no to anybody else. So if you want to do that today or if you believe that, just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. When I was your enemy, you still came for me. So from this point forward, I'm giving you my entire life. There's no area I'm leaving hidden from you. I am going to live for you from this point forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thanks for letting me speak with you guys today. Ushers, you guys can come on up. We're going to go ahead and receive this week's offering. Um, let's pray over that real quick. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for every giver in here. God, we thank you that you have been so faithful to this church, God. God, that you've helped us to just continue to have every resource that we need. And we pray that you would bless every person in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you guys can go ahead. If you guys look in your seats, you'll see uh, these little guys here. Louis, Lana, you guys can come on up. Uh, you guys will see these, these things right here. These are some prayer cards. If you guys don't know these guys, this is Louis and Lonnie. They are some of our missionaries here at the church. And we are going to... Uh, you guys are heading back when? Um, by out, uh, November 6th. November 6th. Yeah. So next week or so? Yeah, but we're only in Missouri until maybe, uh, uh, maybe Monday after next Sunday. Got it. So these guys just wanted to talk to you for a little bit, and you should be good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for, uh, for your prayers, and we're just saying goodbye because we probably won't see you next Sunday. Two big things for 24, 2024 for us is the Philippines has many, they send out many workers worldwide. They get the opportunity because they have work visas to go into uh, unreached people group nations. So <clears throat> one of our focuses, one of our big prayers for this, this coming year is to connect with an agency or two that has a manager that has a, that is a Christian spot possible um, people that are applying for jobs overseas that have a Christian that are Christians as well that we can get connected with them and train them to be a missionary first before a worker and see then they don't even need support because they already have a job over there and they can get in places that we can't so and another another Wow. to do medical medicine with dentistry, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, and also uh, Western medicine as well. Um, just pray for favor with that. Um, it, the teams will also include Taiwanese as well. They're on fire for God, like unbelievable. Uh, so just, just pray that we just give us guidance. Yeah. So, um, thank you so much for all your prayers, love, and giving. 
because through your prayers, we can reach out and continue to, to share Jesus and make disciples. So thank you so much for all, for all the uh, members of our uh, FCFC family. And thank you so much, God. Let's pray for these guys. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for Louie and Lonnie. God, we thank you for the call on their life, God. God, we just pray that you would continue just to increase their territory, the things that's happening. God, I pray for just supernatural connections. God, the ones that they currently have would increase. And God, that the ones that they need would just show up, Father. God, we thank you, Lord, for just you, by your spirit, working in and through them. We pray you bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys all stand up? It's great to see you. Uh, just a reminder, we decided on the trunk or treat, we're going to combine that and only do that at the Warrington campus. And so we would encourage you to come out there and check it out. Um, that's happening this week, so it's going to be good. All right. Amen. You guys are dismissed. We'll see you next week.